Hello and welcome to slide review. So today we are going back to our last GI case where we looked predominantly at malignant uh, lesions involving the colon, anus, and appendix. As always, we start with our standard disclaimer. And if there are any questions, comments, concerns, uh, things that you liked about the lecture or about the challenge cases, please let us know in the comments. Um, and as always, with the challenge cases, we're simply going to go over that. We aren't going to go over the lecture material, but there will be a link in the description uh, so that you can easily access the video. Oh. And ah, there we go. Okay, so 20 cases. We're going to go relatively quickly through these. Um, and let's get started. So case one, we can see that this is appendix. There's a lot of helpful dots, or hopefully they're helpful. Um, but we don't really appreciate anything at this power. Um, you do see some lymphoid aggregates. Remember, these are normal within the appendix. Um, so let's just go to our dots in the interest of time. First one here. And hopefully you can see this, what we have here. This is definitely what they're dotting. Uh, these are goblet cells. And this is uh, the cirrhosal surface. So collection of goblet cells within the appendiceal wall. It looks like there's more here. So let's just see what we have at our other dots. Maybe there'll be something a little more prominent. This one's kind of in between, so I'm not sure which piece they're talking about. Nothing too obvious on this side. Uh, it is hemorrhagic. Again, there is some inflammation, but you do have to keep that somewhat with a grain of salt um, because the appendix does have uh, inflammatory cells normally. I just want to see if we see more of those goblet cell collections since I already have an idea of what we're looking at here. All right, so I'm not really appreciating too much here. Um, so maybe they were trying to highlight something else, like maybe how this looks irritated and uh, eroded. There was one more dot up here. And again, we start seeing all the goblet cells. And uh, remember, they can mimic signet rings, but the nuclei are more plump. Okay, more plump nuclei. They're not completely pushed to the outside. Um, and some of these cells have more of an elongated than round appearance. But this is just percolating throughout the wall of the appendix. Uh, so this is a goblet cell adenocarcinoma involving the appendix. And again, most of these are, are found within the appendix, and uh, there is debate on whether you can do simply an ap appendectomy or if uh, a right hemicolectomy would be uh, warranted. Case two, still in the appendix. Uh, nothing too obvious. Well, this looks nodular here. This, uh, Maybe it's fibrous obliteration. It's kind of hard to tell from here. Um, this is sort of in that nodular area, but it kind of looks to me more like we're not uh, deep enough in this section, maybe. But okay, I kind of want to know what this nodular area is. Yeah, and this is our lesion of interest. So what we see is like this somewhat haphazard fibrous arrangement, and this is not something I believe I had in your handout, um, but what we have are these somewhat well-differentiated tubular structures. 
However, even even though they're well differentiated, they're in an area that doesn't belong, right? This, they don't look like uh, normal columnar uh, mucosa that we would expect to see elsewhere. I'm trying to see if we have any in here. It kind of looks like there is maybe just some obliteration. Uh, whoops. Maybe if we go to one of the cross sections. Yeah, so this is normal columnar epithelium that we would expect to see in the appendix and colon, okay? Um, so you know that there's uh, uh, mucin, cytoplasmic mucin that's toward the apical surface, and we have maybe some lymphocytes and stuff within, uh, the, within the epithelium, but nothing that looks to a typical. And if we go back to these guys, what we notice is that we don't have that cytoplasmic mucin, right? These are relatively uh, cuboidal to low columnar. Um, and they, they do have this open chromatin with, uh, maybe it's partially stippled. It looks like there's some nucleoli. Um, and not too much else to say about this, um, but these tubular structures um, in this somewhat fibrous background, this is a tubular carcinoma involving the appendix. So something a little different. Case three. Uh, I'm just going to tell you that we are still in the appendix. I, this definitely looks tubular, but it's difficult to tell from the picture alone where you are. And this all looks like layered mucin. Maybe we have some sloughed off cells here. Uh, let's see if we're lucky and we get some epithelium. And we do, um, but it's not in the best condition. So it's somewhat hard to evaluate, but hopefully, uh, if you've gone through the lecture, you know that we're looking uh, to see if there's any dysplasia um, because now we're in the realm of are we looking simply at a cystoadenoma, sorry, a mucinous cystoadenoma? Is this uh, a low grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm or lamin, or does it have high grade dysplasia, making it a hamin? Uh, I I suppose we should also include in there, uh, well, our high grade is already mucinous, but um, also want to think about if we had seroso involvement, is this maybe metastatic? And so far, nothing. Like, this looks pretty bland. Uh, there's some pigment in here, so I'm wondering if maybe it had bled at some point. We have some hemocytorin. So it kind of has like that golden texture, but again, the uh, resolution's not great when we're scanned in really high on this case. Um, but you know, that's that's just how it goes. Not not every case is is perfect, and uh, not every stain goes perfectly. And sometimes uh, you need to adjust your eye to different staining methods. Uh, particularly with console cases. These are, look, these look like foamy macrophages. And why am I saying that and not uh, the goblet cell carcinoma is because uh, the nuclei are rounder. They're not really pushed to the periphery, maybe in a couple of the cells, but they're mostly central. And they're only right around this cystic area. Uh, so that's all consistent. Okay, there really isn't much going on here, and what is here is somewhat difficult to evaluate. Um, this is, it looks busy, and I think part of that is because it's kind of sloughed into um, the lumen. So I think some of that crowded appearance is artifactual. I really don't think this is dysplastic though, and we're almost at the end of it. 
you always want to watch out too when you have uh, areas that look more discohesive, um, just to make sure you're not missing something. And here we have some nice epithelium, and this looks relatively happy, right? This is uh, perfect columnar epithelium, single layer that we would expect to see not only in the appendix but also uh, within the colon. So there are some goblet cells in here, but we expect goblet cells to be there. So maybe some of those were goblet cells in the other area, which again is totally fine. They didn't look uh, like acinar or tubular formation. Um, and this looks just really bland. Um, so, okay, at this point, again, that looks okay. I think it's just maybe the cut uh, where it looks semi, uh, almost like it's pseudostratified. Um, but the overall look hasn't changed. Okay, and we're at the end. All right, so not seeing any overt dysplasia, at least in this section. So at this point, um, I feel that this is a, a mucinous cisadenoma involving the appendix. Case four, so still within the appendix, and we have fat, fibrous tissue. This looks like most of the epithelium's been sloughed off. Um, so this actually is the area that's catching my eye. Um, it looks really busy, but still uh, maintaining epithelial layer. And what we see are serrations in the epithelial surface. Okay, but nothing that's really uh, polypoid and projecting into the surface. This is a relatively flat lesion um, that's involving the append uh, appendiceal epithelium. And we see that there's dilatation towards the muscularis mucosae. Knight's lateral projections. Okay, so this is a sessile serrated lesion involving the appendix. And again, you're looking for that lateral extension, uh, lateral dilatation of the base. This one even actually looks like a boot. It's not completely down, but uh, that's the idea that you're looking for with this. Case five, colon. And I'm telling you colon because it's difficult to uh, appreciate from this. And it looks busy. Lots of inflammation. Uh, definitely can, hopefully you can pick up those eosinophils even at uh, this low level. And we don't know if this is uh, right colon or left colon, um, but even for the right colon, this is too much. And, and all these eosinophils really should catch your eye uh, and make you pause. And it looks like we do have some elements of cryptitis. Okay, we have neutrophils that are within the crypts here. It has somewhat of a distorted appearance. Um, again, it's hard to tell what's up, what's down. Uh, it does impart like maybe there's expansion or maybe polypoid type appearance. Um, but the, the crypts aren't exactly evenly spaced. They're not exactly evenly sized. And with all this inflammation and expansion, um, I'm at least leaning towards uh, inflammatory polyp. This doesn't look like the right type of inflammation for our inflammatory bowel disease. 
what I'd really like to see, um, well, I guess we do have some here, some granulation tissue. Uh, so granulation, sorry, granulation tissue, meaning that we have neutrophils, we have new vessel formation, uh, and there is some erosion at the surface, but again, um, is this instrumental or what they saw in the patient? I think that's uh, difficult to assess. And there is a bit of an increased um, collagenous component um, where we have, like it has more of a, uh, like, well, I shouldn't say collagenous, like it is, it is collagen. We do have fibers, but um, it, it does not look like a collagenous colitis, right? Because collagenous colitis would have to be underneath the, the uh, epithelial surface, and it doesn't look like that's expanded. Maybe a little over here. Uh, that could just actually be the cut, because we're not seeing like the the wax dripping or candle sign. Um, so for me, I'm favoring an inflammatory fibroid polyp with this. Um, but again, there's a, a lot of questions left and having the clinical history to correlate with this really uh, matters. K6, so we have epithelium on both ends um, and this expansion in between. So it's somewhat questionable about the orientation Uh, and epithelium looks somewhat happy. Um, does look like maybe we have some uh, like smooth muscle streaming here. This, these somewhat more dense pink deposits. Uh, there are, these are plasma cells. Okay, so we, eosinophils. Obviously we have some lymphocytes as well. Uh, so there is an inflammatory component. Okay. Well, let's see what this expanded area looks like. And the surface too. Oh, and this, ac this actually looks similar to what we saw in the previous case. So again, lots of eosinophils in here. We can tell that's more edematous. Um, you can see the, the collagen fibers a little easier. This is actually uh, quite impressive for that. Um, but the epithelium itself does not look crazy. So again, uh, this is likely in the realm of inflammatory polyps. Let's see if we can find any areas that look ulcerated. Hard to tell. Um, some of these just might be denuded. And again, that can be related to instrumentation, like when they're taking uh, the biopsy, even when we're embedding. Uh, or submitting grossly. Um, but yeah, that's where I would go with this is uh, inflammatory polyp. Um, I don't think the fibrous component is super impressive, um, but you could mention that too and, and say like an inflammatory fibroid polyp again as well. K7. So it looks like we have two pictures. This is definitely polypoid, right? And, okay. Oh, well, this is nice. So what we have here, this um, more dense pink stuff, this is smooth muscle. 
And I mean, this is all muscle down here, but just to kind of prove that, um, we have our elongated cells within the muscle fibers themselves, or the muscle cells, and the, the fibers of the, of the muscle cells are, are streaming. You can see how they're coming all the way up and they're making like these finger-like projections. Um, this is a little funny though. It's very, very busy. Hmm. So I'm wondering if there's like some element of uh, dysplasia in this. But at the most I would go with this would be uh, questioning whether or not there's low grade dysplasia. This does not look high grade to me, um, but I kind of want a second set of eyes on it. Um, just because how everything's uh, coming up a little more and our cells are maybe more reactive looking, um, but I'd still wanna show it. Lots of plasma cells in here. And what we also see is uh, dilatation of these areas. Um, So between the streaming muscle, the dilated areas, whether or not there's uh, some low-grade dysplasia or not, um, I'm in the realm of uh, hamartomatous polyp. Because that all looks... Hmm. Um, so when we think hamartomatous polyps, of course, they can happen on their own, um, but for uh, GI, we also think of things like Putz-Jaeger. Um, so this is consistent with a Putz-Jaeger polyp. But again, I, I would just want to show this to at least one other person to see what they thought about the busyness of the epithelium. Case eight, and this is really impressive. Like we see, like it's almost all very dilated. Um, and obviously polypoid. And if we go down here, again, we start picking up that very densely pink uh, smooth muscle. Again, we see it streaming out. Uh, and uh, sorry, in amortomatous polyps, they call this uh, arborizing, where you have this branching of the smooth muscle that goes up uh, and spreads throughout the, the polyp. Um, but again, we have the same uh, dilation. And I'm not seeing anything in this one, at least right away, that uh, looks Displaced or questionably dysplastic, like the, the last one. I still feel that the last one had low grade dysplasia, but um, if someone else wanted to comment on that, that would be absolutely wonderful. Yeah, this looks all very much the same. It's maybe a little more blue, but we go in and we see it's because of inflammation. So this is another uh, Putz-Jaeger or hamartomatous polyp. Case nine. Uh, so what catches your eye? And again, we, this is uh, the, the level. So we have one level here and one level here. Uh, is this expansion within the mucosa? It's can't necessarily tell if it's involving the surface or not. Um, but let's go in. All right. 
Uh, I know why I picked this case. And uh, probably to, to make this more, make more sense, it's been uh, a couple weeks now since I've looked at these slides, but when we go in, all this expansion within the mucosa, what we see is that it doesn't look fibrillary, okay? It doesn't look like collagen, it doesn't look like uh, fibrin, it doesn't look like serum. This is, uh, someone needs to change the battery in their picture. <laughs> Uh, that's what the BB was. Um, but when we say amorphous material, this is amorphous. We There's no real structure to the material itself. Sure, there's lots of inflammation scattered throughout it, and there's some blood, but the material itself does not have inflammation. And if you were inclined to polarize this, what you would notice is what we refer to as apple green by refringence. Um, so hopefully that buzzword is enough uh, to tell you that this is amyloid. And if you go to the surface, the surface is essentially normal. Um, often it's the amyloid that gives the appearance of the polyp, um, but the mucosa is typically benign. Um, so again, for amyloidosis, usually uh, older patients. And if you go over here, for sake of completion, what we see is that this is relatively benign. So uh, the rest of the case, uh, the epithelium and mucosa may be a little inflamed, but again, we don't know exactly where they uh, took the polyp from. So I really want to caution you on commenting too much on inflammation if you aren't sure where in the colon they biopsied something from, um, because your right colon is going to have a lot more um, inflammation, as well as remember it can have uh, things like your penicill uh, metaplasia that's normal within the right colon, um, but when you start moving towards the left, you expect less inflammation and uh, panacell metaplasia becomes, starts to become abnormal. Okay, so amyloid polyp, again, not something that we covered in the lecture, but something I thought was really interesting. Again, in the colon, and this is a very small polyp, looks like. And what we see is at the surface, there's some areas that maybe look dilated. I think this one is really good for that. And it has this serrated appearance. I know this is subtle, but these can be subtle. And here, again, um, you can't tell really where it's going to the surface. I think that makes this hard, but um, the serrated appearance but otherwise relatively bland. Um, so this is a hyperplastic polyp. And hopefully you can start to pick out the serrations. Case 11. Um, and what we see again is this is re relatively small polyp. Um, It looks like maybe it was bisected because these pieces don't look exactly the same. And again, there's some very slight dilatation at the surface. Again, this one also a little dilated. Here's it's a it's a little dilated, um, but it's not necessarily giving you this super hyperplastic appearance. And this is where polyps can be extremely subtle. Let's see, maybe questionable there, but it's like right at the surface. Here again, that looks slightly dilated, very slight. Um, 
So this is most consistent with a hyperplastic polyp. And again, even if these are two different pieces and they said that they sample two polyps, uh, two hyperplastic polyps should not change the patient's overall surveillance. Uh, three is the, the magic number for that. Case 12. So they probably had a patient label down here, and that's probably why this is blacked out. But we have, again, very small polyps or polyps. Uh, you can always say fragment of polyps, fragments of polyps. Um, and what do we have? So this is definitely abnormal, right? Like it's it's dilated. Um, you can see this tiny strip of muscularis mucosa. Not really impressed by the basal dilatation, but it's definitely dilated here and it's definitely serrated. So hopefully you can see all the serrations in uh, the mucosal surface there. Here, this is getting towards basal dilatation because again, here's our muscularis mucosae. And this is falling apart. So you don't want to comment too much on that uh, simply because it is falling apart. We go here, we start seeing these guys where we have, yeah, it's serrated and it's dilated. But remember, we're looking for that lateral expansion. This is somewhat borderline. And why do I say that? Yeah, it's dilated at the base, but it's almost like a stovepipe or test tube all the way up and down. Um, it's dilated, but it's the same. And all you need is one area that has good basal dilatation. Here we don't really have muscularis mucosae, and here it doesn't look like we do either. But we have these areas, and this it doesn't look overly polypoid. Again, here this looks dilated with lateral expansion at the base. Um, so this is consistent with a sessile serrated adenoma or sessile serrated uh, lesion. Case 13. So again, either multiple polyps or uh, the same polyp that they've transected. Uh, from experience, I would tell you that this is most likely multiple polyps. And again, we already start seeing that uh, basal dilatation. And I know it's relatively uh, grasping, but this is muscularis mucosae here. It's barely hanging on. And we see multiple crypts already have that dilatation. You can see it here right? Um, because if these are two halves of a 3D structure and this is your core, um, these dilated areas are extending down to the base. And again, here, you don't necessarily have the muscular mucosae, but you can see how these serrated lesions are expanding towards the bottom, and this is the surface. And often this is what happens with these cases when you get them is uh, they're not perfect. They may not even be um, embedded very nicely because uh, these can be very difficult to embed. This is vegetable material, okay? Um, so if you aren't sure, this is what vegetable matter looks like when we embed it. So pretty much this whole thing, or multiple things, so I would say something like uh, multiple fragments of sessile serrated lesion or sessile serrated adenoma. Case 14. So this, this one is different from the others. It's a cross section, so you know they went in and took this out. Um, and it's very, very busy. And we see that it's very blue. This is most likely the normal. So if you go in, you see that indeed it is very blue. You have uh, very few goblet cells, and that's what imparts the the blue appearance to the super uh, to the 
epithelial surface of these lesions. And there is low-grade dysplasia in this. I don't think it's high-grade. And it looks tubular, right? Doesn't look villous. Um, okay. This is a very large lesion. Um, so this is a tubular adenoma. And most likely the reason that this patient had excision based off of this slide alone is that you see that this is a very large lesion. Uh, like to do a full section on a slide, this is at least two centimeters. So this would be too big for them to remove on colonoscopy. So this um, was likely the indication for removal. And that still looks like low-grade dysplasia. So um, this is a tubular adenoma. Case 15. So again, we have an excisional specimen, right? We have serosal surface, here's our fat, our muscularis propria, uh, submucosa, muscularis mucosa, and your epithelium. And what we see is we have two areas. This looks normal, this looks normal, but these are abnormal. Lymphoid aggregates, especially, we, again, we don't know exactly where this is in the bowel, um, but those are not necessarily unusual. And what we see is, again, this is really blue. There is low-grade dysplasia with this. So this is a TA over here, tubular adenoma. If we go over here, we see the same thing. But we know this is not the same lesion. Um, because again, we have normal mucosa on both sides, and this is a full cross section. So we know that this wasn't like bisected, and these are um, two areas of the same thing. So having multiple tubular adenomas is commonly associated with um, familial um, predilections like familial adenomatous polyposis or FAP. Um, so let's say if you got the bowel resection and the patient literally has like 50, 100 of these. This is most consistent with FAP, um, but just having, like if all you had was the two polyps here, then you would just say like uh, tubular adenoma times two, okay? K16, looks like we have a helpful dot, um, but what we can see right away is that this is extremely blue, um, it does not look too happy. But let's just start at the top since we know they gave us something at the bottom. Are we going to load? There you might not. Um, but similar to previous, it's unfortunate that's not loading. Um, it's too blue, right? So yeah, there's mucus, but there's not really a lot of goblet cells. So at least in the tubular adenoma range, hopefully that's where you are, because that's where I am. Uh, and we see that it's really inflamed. And what helps you out too is like, this is normal. So if you're comparing this to this, you can see the difference, the loss of those goblet cells. Remember your colon likes to be uh, lubricated, because um, that just helps everything pass through. So, okay, we have at least tubular adenoma. So I have a feeling I know what the dots are. Hmm. Well, that's not good. And they dotted here. But what I don't like is I don't like this stuff. I don't like these guys over here. Um, so we have this somewhat desmoplastic reaction. These are more angulated. Um, 
And sometimes uh, in areas of the body, you can almost pick out the, the basement membrane on each knee. I, this extravasated mucin also is worrisome. Um, this is cauterized down here, but it looks like this process is extending down, and I think that's difficult to necessarily evaluate, but um, I don't like these guys just kind of being on their own again in this somewhat uh, desmoplastic background, um, which you don't always get. So um, it's nice when you have desmoplasia, uh, really nice when you have it, but it, it doesn't always happen. Um, so this, and again, this is something I would like to show someone else just to see what they think. But to me, uh, this is, uh, well, we have aspects that are definitely like tubular adenoma. Um, I think this is a little more tubular adenoma. And then we have areas that look more elongated, finger-like. Um, so an aspect of like a tubular villus adenoma. So maybe just call it tubular villus adenoma. Um, if we assume it's all the same thing. I think the, the finger-like projections, which are like all of these guys, uh, where it almost looks papillary, so stuff like this. Um, like that's definitely more than a quarter of this lesion. Remember, that's our cutoff. So this is at, uh, sorry, tubular, tubular villus adenoma uh, with uh, at least superficially invasive adenocarcinoma. Um, so sorry to top line that, you'd say uh, invasive adenocarcinoma. And based off of what we have here, mm, going between well differentiated and mod moderately differentiated. Uh, so I'd probably say moderately differentiated. So um, invasive adenocarcinoma, comma, moderately differentiated, comma, arising in a background of tubular villus adenoma. That's most likely how I would top line this because this is this is invasive. All right. Case 17. It doesn't really look like much. It's definitely bloody down here. Um, we have our superficial surface. So let's see what we got. This kind of looks expanded. So I think I want to go closer look because this looks unusual. Um, I don't think that was really appreciable. At, well, kind of at low power. It's at least ulcerated because I'm not seeing surface. Let's see what this looks like. Mm. Okay. Uh, so even though these aren't necessarily clear, let's see if I can find a good spot. Hmm. These are more plump, and I think someone is potentially going to argue with me a little bit on these, and that's okay. Um, but uh, these are very round cells, and they have nuclei that for the most part are pushed to the side and somewhat flattened. I know there's examples like this guy here that are not behaving. Um, and they aren't really, like they're, they're discohesive. They're not really sticking together to form a mass. They're kind of just everywhere. Um, and this probably goes actually pretty deep just based off of how this lesion likes to work. 
can see it coming down here. You can see them uh, quite deep, actually. So that's probably what all of this is. Let's see if we can find an area with intact mucosa. Um, because even though you can have uh, erosions and ulcerations of the, the surface, um, this lesion in particular does not involve epithelium. It kind of just likes to be everywhere in between. Um, I'm not really seeing it here, so that's good. So it's kind of just more in, in this area, so all this, this kind of stuff. But what these are is signet rings. So this is uh, invasive adenocarcinoma, comma, signet ring type. And hopefully you can appreciate how scary these are um, because it doesn't look like much when you're at low power, but now that we know where they are, you can kind of see how it takes up this entire area. I wouldn't be surprised if there's more down here. And look, there are. Um, now, uh, I don't think it's really involving this area, but um, you can see how it's above, and then we have uh, muscularis propria, looks like. Yeah, this is muscularis propria, these the dual layers of muscle, and you can see how it's on both sides. So this is uh, a signet ring carcinoma involving the colon. Case 18, um, so what we see is this very papillary lesion, very pink, and lots of it. <laughs> And it's involving skin. So this is an anal lesion. Uh, and let's see what we find. Because this is definitely not happy. Well, what I'm looking for are... Um, Coilocytes. I'm looking for uh, dysplasia. And there's this is dysplastic um, in that it, it all looks the same. I'm not really seeing. Uh, Oh, um, da, 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 like uh, really high grade dysplasia. I'm not necessarily worried about um, uh, like a carcinoma in situ because we see that there is like this is more basal. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell where the surface is, though, but I imagine this was difficult to uh, embed. It is irritated, like we see neutrophils. Um, uh, always hunting for coilocytes, right? Um, and who knows, you could go back to this at a later point, look at the video and be like, oh, look, I lost over like 10 of them. Um, but this looks relatively low grade. Here we can see like this is like dyskeratotic. Um, okay, so we have this uh, huge papillary verucoid lesion, not really appreciating a lot like hyperkeratosis. Um, but again, uh, if this was involving, let's say, um, like the the lower anal tract, um, because again, we have uh, squamous mucosa down there. You can see these really nice papillary 
projections. Um, so this is a condyloma. So I've seen some vacuoles, but no real raisinoid, large raisinoid cells. Um, and because of the size, like uh, if we zoom out again, can appreciate how large this is. Uh, this is encompassing an entire slide, and uh, I have a feeling that this is not everything that they submitted, everything that they took off the patient. Um, so this is condyloma cuminatum, um, which is fine, but because of the size, this is most consistent with a giant condyloma or a bushke lowenstein tumor. Um, and again, that just refers to the very large size, but um, that's what I think we have here. Case 19, so we have two sections, and this area of the slide just looks a little cleaner, so we'll go over here. Okay, and this is squamous mucosa. We can see that there is, uh, here is our base and it's extending up. And we don't really have any maturity, right? What, what's at the bottom looks pretty much the same as what it, what's at the top. It's all very uh, blue. It imparts this uh, basaloid type appearance. And it's just the, the whole thing. Um, difficulty is do we have invasion or is this in situ? I don't really like how this is coming down, but I don't think that's necessarily definitive. I don't like this because this is separate. These look like single cells. Um, and kind of the same thing here. So again, having these uh, areas, like even if they're nodular and coming down from the surface, this to me is already uh, uh, fairly convincing for an invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Again, this, this is great for a challenge because this is not easy. Um, and because the whole thing looks extremely basalite, I would call this the anus squamous cell carcinoma basaloid type. Um, and remember, they have that uh, cloacogenic carcinoma for the basaloid type type of uh, squamous cell carcinoma that involves the anus. Case 20, so this is the last case, and we can see that it's extremely busy. Uh, these are the same piece, uh, and this looks very mixoid. Okay, very blue. So let's just go take a look at what that is. Although you should already have really high suspicion. And what we see are these uh, pools of mucin with these neoplastic cells. There's nothing about these cells that is normal or that belongs here. Um, and we can see that it goes up, up, up to the surface. So this is already uh, a mucinous adenocarcinoma, okay? Oh, and we're not done yet because there is something else here. So this is mucinous adenocarcinoma involving the anus, right? Because we have skin here, um, or uh, squamous epithelium. We have perikeratosis, right? And perikeratosis, always makes us go, hey, let's pause and take a look at what's going on here. And what we see are these very large cells that are just percolating up through pretty much the entire, uh, like all, all layers of the squamous epithelium. And they don't look like keratinocytes, right? Like they're relatively uh, round. Some of them are very large with the irregular nuclei, but they, they have, uh, some of them look vacuolated. 
Uh, so let's see if we can find something better, but it's going up through all layers. This can't tell if that's a cell or just extravasated mucin. And then it kind of looks like we lose it. So maybe it's just that one area. Um, because these look, okay, these look like keratinocytes that have been uh, glycogenated. You can see the, there is some ax, some uh, aspect of spongiosis. You can see the uh, desmosomes between the cells holding them together. Um, but these are keratinocytes. They're not necessarily happy. I don't think I would be with uh, that lesion underneath, but um, these are very different cells. Okay. Hopefully you can appreciate that. Uh, and there's also no spongiosis between them. Um, so what are these? Hopefully someone uh, understands where I'm going with this, but we have these large cells that are somewhat vacuolated. They're extending through all uh, a vertical extension through the uh, epithelium. And it looks like it kind of ends here, but so does our epithelium. <laughs> uh, so this is actually extramammary patches disease involving the anus. So this patient has two things going on. So this is Paget's disease here, and they have this uh, mucinous adenocarcinoma. Yeah, and it looks like that's probably the only area that has Paget's, because the rest of this, again, is um, irritated. It has this perikeratosis um, that does not look like Paget's disease. So just that one area. Um, so make sure you spend some time on that. Spend a little time on, on this, since this is a, a different variant that we didn't see um, within our lecture. And here should be the, the list of the cases. Um, and that's what we have for today. So if you like this video, please hit like, uh, share on social media. And um, if you aren't subscribed to us, please hit subscribe so you can be notified when we have new content out. Uh, we welcome any uh, comments about the cases. If you have uh, different differentials uh, than what I presented or, or different ideas on um, dysplasia or differentiation, uh, I would love to hear that. And we will see you next week for another slide review.